a very good morning and warm welcome to all the delegates for this particular session this is the international infothon conclave organized by the department of it in association with itsc of thakur college of science and commerce the case for today's session dr arlad kubrekar the speaker for today's session dr rol rodrigues honorable principal madam dr mrs chaitali chakravarti dr sg asgekar dr santosh singh the conveners of this particular conclave all the members of the organizing committee staff members and lovely delegates across the world it's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you all for the third day and the first session of this particular international infothon i conclave the journey of thakur college began in 1992 with the junior college and followed with 1997 with the commerce section and then in 1999 with the science section at present the college is really proud of to complete the three cycles of nac with a grade in the third cycle the college has been conferred with the autonomy by the ugc new delhi for the period of 10 years with effective from the academic year 2019-20 the college has also been uh, given the best college award by the university of mumbai for the academic year 2018-19 and the college has got the prestigious ranking of education world 55th in india 15th in maharashtra and 13th in mumbai with this brief introduction of the college we are going to begin this particular session we have with us dr mrs cti chakravarti the honorable principal of thakur college of science and commerce may kindly request ma'am to give her welcome speech please over to you ma'am thank you vinit and good morning to all of you it's my great pleasure to welcome you for the final day of the international infothon conclave iic 2020 the conclave was based on theme skill and talent enhancement program step during covid and it has nine it had nine different tracks it set a new benchmark for us in total there were 4503 participants who had registered for the conclave on various tracks from different states of india as well as ireland canada iceland iraq oman usa and australia we are meeting at a time when the entire world is passing through a most critical time during this tough time we have spread education to about 15000 participants who joined through our various webinars conferences and conclave the technology will con continue to plug and play a vital role in our lives during all times it's important that technological progress keeps us in space with growing requirement and we need to constantly brainstorm and share with our vision now in today's world it is very important that we share if we don't share we cannot grow now keeping to yourself cannot make you efficient information technology has become more of a necessity for us now rather than a facility the world has truly become a global village and the thirst for more knowledge and information has been a driving force for all inventions in information technology around the world now life has become much less manual it's simplified because of the advancements of information technology with this i once i welcome our session guest dr raul waxon from waxon school of business hyderabad sir i welcome you once again today you were there on a the first day also who is from spain from this for this session i also welcome my student alad who is the main speaker who is the chief guest for the function alad we are happy to see you and see you grow also great that's also a great feather to our cap i welcome all the participants speakers guest of the day and all the delegates who has made this international infothon conclave iic 2020 session a successful one thank you very much thank you so much ma'am for your inspiring words you are always the inspiration and guiding force for all such kind of programs where it is possible for every member of tcsc thakur college of science and commerce to arrange organize such kind of programs thank you so much ma'am for your kind support friends we have dr alhad kubrekar who is a british citizen and prestigious alumnus of tcsc 
with this morning to with us. He is the chief guest for the function. I would like to give his brief introduction before he is going to give his inaugural address. He has completed his PhD in seamless session motility framework for next generation networks that is in mobile computing from University of Glamorgan, UK. He was the lecturer of University of South Wales for six years. At the same time, he was shouldering the responsibility of the head for the mobile application development division, CMAS University South Wales. At present, he is in a position of CTO and co-founder of My Lifeguard Limited UK. He is the external consultant for General Dynamics UK Limited. He is the solution architect for ICE Wish EU project. He is also the head of the software development mapper of EU project. By now, he has developed around 24 mobile applications. He has one international patent to his credit with 11 prestigious IEEE research publications. With this brief introduction, may I kindly request Dr. Allah Kourekar to please address this session in the capacity of the chief guest. Sir, over to you. Uh, thank you, Vinit, sir, and uh, hello, everyone at Taku College and international uh, participants as well. It's always nice to uh, be uh, in touch with our college when we started our career and then uh, went on to do something really good in life. Uh, basically, my area of uh, work has been IoT for quite some time, even before many of you must have heard about IoT, which is Internet of Things. Now, what is Internet of Things coming to that point? Connected devices that transfer data over a network without any human machine interaction or machine to machine interaction are IoT devices. And there are plenty of IoT devices around as of today. You see a lot of things like the Philips U, Google Home, Alexa. There's a lot out there in the market. When I started, my first interest in IoT was at Thakur College in 2003, where we created a, a sort of a little wooden box with relay switches in, and you could control it from a computer by pressing one, two, three, four, but things have moved on since then. So with this, I'm going to talk briefly about two types of IOTs. One is the industrial IOT and smart homes. Now let's focus on smart homes because every day you hear that there are new devices available in the market. And what is a smart home? So a smart home basically is a collection of devices in your home that are connected via network and should usually take intelligent decisions for you. But that does not happen anymore. What you do as of today is you go into your mobile app and start controlling the devices and that's too cumbersome. So what you have today as a smart home is not actually a smart home. On an average, we have a lot of connected devices in the home. So for example, if I open my mobile app for my router, I can actually see that I have 110 connected devices at the moment at home. And what are these connected devices? Not just your laptops, iPads, mobile phones, but also things like wireless speaker systems. So here I've got an Alexa, which is basically a smart home speaker, which is also here you see a Google Home, which is a smart speaker as well. Then we have got thermostat. So I have a thermostat here. So this is actually a connected thermostat. So this can actually make decisions for me. So for example, while I'm coming home, my mobile phone, my car knows that I'm coming home. And at that point in time, it sets the temperature of my home and that's it. I've got a warm home to come back to. Then we have got monitoring systems. So I've got here a very interesting thing, which is like a security camera, but this is something we build. Uh, but what is interesting about this is it is totally wireless. You just put batteries in and just close this box and that's it. Your camera is ready. You don't need any wires. So there are a lot of devices like these now doorbells, for example, I've got a doorbell in front of my home and during this COVID-19 times, my wife does not want to open the door because she does not know who is at the door. So she talks to those people over the mobile app to keep the social distancing. So that works quite well. You've got a lot of other small devices like a smoke detector, a light bulb. You have also, I've got a home energy monitor so that tells me how much electricity my wife is consuming. Uh, so I can tell her that look at the bill. So I've actually got how much washing machine she used. 
I've got it on my mobile app, so I know how much money she has spent. Let me just show that to you because it's fairly interesting. So I make sure that she cuts down on all her washing because it costs a lot of money for us. So here you can actually see for me, she has actually done 24.21 kilowatts and we are just halfway into the month. So I can then multiply this with how much money I pay for this. And it gives me a lot of information. So every device in my home as of today is connected. Then the other interesting thing I've got here is a door lock. Now if you look at this door lock, it does not look like a door lock, but it has a very simple mechanism. It fits on the back of your key. So your key goes in here. And when you are near to the door, this turns around and basically your door opens as simple as that. So you've got all sorts of devices like these. Then you've got smart refrigerators, for example. The smart refrigerator, I'll come to that use case a bit later. We have got laundry machines. We have also got water leak detectors. And this is a water leak detector, for example. So this has got a lead at the bottom. And when it detects water, these two come together and automatically the water is detected. There are many more use cases, but I'll come to that in a minute. But let me show you. Uh, some other things like a panic button. If I press this panic button, I can receive a call, my lights turn on. There are a lot of things that can be done, but I'll come to the use cases in a minute. So there's a lot of things you can do with smart homes, combining these things together. And that is where I created a platform for all these devices to talk to one another, to make them smart. So basically, why did smart homes did not pick up? And the problem is that the users felt that it was why, why do I need a smart home? That is the first question. If I ask my mother as of today, she says, no, I can get up, turn on the light by pressing the switch. Why do I need a smart home? So people did not feel the need for smart home. The other thing was there were quite complicated standards like Z-Wave, Zigbee, BLE. And to somebody like my mother, it is too complicated to understand whether if I buy a device, whether it will work or not. Difficult setup. People had a lot of difficulties in setting up their smart homes. A lot of times companies actually shut down and they have already invested in very expensive smart homes that do not work anymore. Like a light bulb previously costed $50, but then Wi-Fi came into picture. And then a light bulb of this sort cost only $10 to buy, which is much cheaper. And as I said earlier, were homes really smart? No, because you need to control them from an app or a tablet, which is not a really good thing. Then came Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi was the savior. So a Chinese company started off building IoT chipsets called Espressive. And there was no need for a hub. And here I've got a Node MCU, which many of you will recognize. And this is a very nice uh, little device that you can buy on Amazon or whatever for 200 rupees or 300 rupees. And basically you can program this chipset to do a lot of different things. So you can actually connect a couple of uh, cables here to different hardware devices and you can program it and start working with it. So this is a very interesting device. If you want to start off with IoT, maybe this is the best device for you to get started cheap and this should work for you. So basically I will show you a few examples, for example, how this whole platform should work. Firstly, I do not believe that there should be a light switch. Everything should be automatic. For example, uh, in the evening, just before sunset, all our lights turn on. Now, the other day I was replacing my router and my wife suddenly realized that the lights have not turned on. Otherwise, she has not touched the light switch for the last maybe two, three years. So now she realizes that, you know, how do I turn on my lights? Uh, you know, that is where the switch comes into play. But otherwise, you don't need to even touch a switch if your smart home is quite intelligent. Now, I'll show you a classic example. Uh, I've got an Alexa here, and that talks to our platform. And you see a light bulb behind me here. And I'm going to use Hindi as a language because I'm quite proud of speaking Hindi. When I see the other Europeans, they usually speak German, Spanish, and other languages. So let's try with this in Hindi. So I'm just going to ask uh, our friend Alexa to turn on the light, but I'm going to do that in Hindi and I, you'll see the light behind me turning off. Alexa, sofa ko chalu kare. It takes a few seconds. Alex, yeah, and there you go. <clears throat> you can see 
And the other day I said something funny, which I'm going to again try today and see if it works. Alexa, sofa ko lal kare. And my light bulb has turned to red. I can just say commands and basically it should turn the light bulbs on, change colors. Alexa, sofa ko ban kare. And there you go, the light bulb has turned off. So similarly, I can do all those sorts of things on uh, my Google Home as well. But do we actually need this? If your smart home is intelligent enough, you don't need any of this. So there are a few use case scenarios, especially during the COVID situation that I thought about and which have been really useful to us. One is before COVID, how many times do you go to the supermarket and not buy the thing that you actually need to buy? If I go with my wife, she buys everything on discount that is available in the superstore, but not the thing that she needs. So we make another trip and it's again the same thing. So we end up going 10 times to the supermarket to buy one thing, but we end up buying everything else. But if you had a smart uh, refrigerator or a kitchen, they would know what things you're running out of, what groceries you're running out of. of. So in that case, uh, basically it would just do an order by itself. It has your credit card number using AI and deep learning. It can actually know what you have been ordering very frequently and it would do those orders for you. Um, so that would be ideal and it comes to your doorstep without having to think about what you need to order. Uh, basically the other thing it could do is your kitchen could actually send you out new recipes based on um, whatever you have at home and then basically you could cook those things based on uh, you know the common question that we have is what should i cook tonight that is the most common question in the home what would you like to have for breakfast for lunch for dinner and if you had those recipes that came automatically based on what ingredients you had that would have been most ideal now with the microwave for example we what we do is we have to read the instructions on uh, on the food product before we put it in the microwave. Rather than that, if I could just put it in the microwave and let the microwave figure it out and then heat the food for me, that would be the most ideal thing. But there's one more thing, during this COVID times, I've noticed a lot of groups on a lot of groups on WhatsApp, people actually send out what they have cooked today. How cool would it be if the microwave just took the picture and sent it to your WhatsApp group by default so everybody knew what you ate and they could comment on it or upload it to Facebook. Now, in, during this COVID times, there is also an extension to IoT. I do not like going to the hospital at this stage because I know what's going on, but I've got a blood pressure condition and that needs to be monitored. So what we did was we integrated a few devices, medical devices like this one. This is a pulse oximeter and I'm just going to put my hand, finger into it. It takes a few seconds to start up, but you can actually see my pulse in a bit. It will be quite high because I'm uh, talking right now. So you can see my oxygen level and pulse rate. And this is actually getting uploaded to the server. So you could also have a glucometer pulse oximeters, uh, uh, blood pressure monitors, and so on that are all interconnected. And at any given point, they, you do your measurements. If you don't do it, you get reminders on your phone, but as soon as you do it, it gets uploaded to the cloud. And based on whether it is out of bounds, whether it is high, your doctor will be notified and then he can call you and say, hey, do this or do that. And that is usually useful in certain cases where, you know, uh, it is too high and uh, you don't know what to do. You need to call the doctor. Instead, if the doctor knows well in advance, he can call you. He can actually do a video call with you. And if it's more critical, he can even send out an ambulance for you. That is what could be done. Uh, apart from that, what I said earlier was this panic button. Now, if an elderly person actually falls down, for example, he can press this panic button and immediately a call will be made to his next of kin or somebody. The lights will be turned on so that he's not afraid of anything. And this can be the future use cases in such sort of a, a scenario. And there's a lot of future to IoT. Uh, by 2025, we are expecting about 21 billion IoT devices to be around. 
artificial intelligence will continue to be a bigger thing routers need to be more secure and smarter which they are not at the moment 5g networks will continue to fuel the growth of iot our cars will even get smarter they will have a lot of information so for example in my car i fitted a little unit which tells me how much my wife drives around so that i know what the fuel levels are because previously she never filled up the fuel and every time i had to go for a meeting i had to fill up the fuel before going so i know all the information about that and of course all this comes at a cost it is never free so you always have security and privacy concerns which are going to grow over and over again because if you think of a smart speaker like this it records almost everything that you speak and then they start giving you lots of advertisements and so on so privacy concerns are a big thing and security we know that hackers will always want to hack into all sorts of devices try to control them or create denial of service attacks so there is a lot of work that goes around iot security so just to wind up i just wanted to show you uh, something very quickly that uh, basically we spoke about the node mcu so i just took this chipset and actually put it in a bulb so this is the bulb with the leds on and what you see here is basically the chipset which is similar to this one so you can actually put this chipset in any of the device like the water leak sensor for example has also got a similar chipset like this one so that's from my end and thank you for having me on the call and i enjoy talking to you thank you Thank you so much, Dr. Alhad, uh, for your inspiring speech. Uh, Dr. Alhad was the chief guest for this particular session, and we are going to start with the session now. But before that, I would like to request Dr. Santosh Singh, the convener of this particular conclave, to give the very purpose of this particular conclave to be organized. So, may I kindly request Dr. Santosh Singh, the IQST coordinator, as well as the convener of this particular conclave, to give us the idea about this particular conclave. over to you dr santosh singh uh, good morning all of you as we are already running short of time so it's my pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of thakur college of science and commerce and as a capacity of iqsc coordinator for international infothen conclave 2020 step during covid 19 under the able guideline of our principal madam and management iqsc of thakur college of science and commerce we take a lot of initiative for a quality education for protection of environment women empowerment and community based social services there is an entire change in education paradigm which we felt during this covid 19 the conclave adopted a theme skill and talent enhancement program during covid 19 and it really share a insight into a recent advancement in the area of information technology and computer science and cutting edge in the recent research work we have covered a wide spectrum of Uh, topics various topic in a recent innovation and development in the field of information technology in last two day 2868 participant got advantage and because of really sensible discussion on a chat box we found how much there was interest i welcome all the delegates all the participant i welcome dr raul and sorry for the delay i welcome dr alhar and i wish here all the participant researcher and my fellow colleagues you will have excellent deliberation for this last day for now the three tracks which are remaining thank you very much over to you dr vinith thank you so much sir to give us the insight about this conclave and now we are going to have a presentation by dr raul but before that i would like to give a very brief introduction of dr raul who is going to speak on quantum artificial intelligence in this particular session dr raul rodriguez is a assistant professor artificial intelligence machine learning and robotics at voxel school of business hyderabad He has done his PhD in artificial intelligence, robotics, and process automation applications. His various collaborations at the foreign level, the two to be mentioned very prominently are Oxford Brookes University UK and European Union government bodies Brussels Belgium. He is a registered expert in the artificial intelligence, intelligent system, multi-agent systems of European Commission, and nominee for Forbes 30 Under 30 2020 list, which is a great achievement by Dr. Rod. He has co-authored two books: *The New Age Leadership: A Critical Insight* along with *Retail Store E*. He has seventy research publications to his credit. He is a weekly contributing writer to various magazines in the field of analytics and emerging technologies. 
the research journal reviewer and associate editor at the Springer Publications. With this very, very brief introduction of Dr. Rao, may I kind of request him to please proceed with his session on quantum AI. Dr. Rao, over to you, please. I also request Dr. Rao to take your complete time because there is a lot of interest in your session. There were maximum participant for your session. So, sir, please take your complete time. Yeah. Thank you I, so much, sir. I will do so. First of all, let me just uh, share the screen so I can show the presentation. Okay, you can all see the screen, correct? Yeah, it's correct, sir. It's visible. All right. All right. So, first of all, this topic is, uh, as you can imagine, quite technical in nature. But I am now going to keep it extremely technical because, of, of course, there are people from different backgrounds as well as uh, non-tech people. Hence, it might not be adequate to go into all the coding area and quantum computing parameters. I'm going to touch upon it briefly, but Overall, and you're going to give you uh, in-depth introduction to what quantum AI is. First of all, what quantum computing is, then how it applies to AI. Uh, moving on as well, what are the current world applications? What could be the future applications? And how you, on your own, with your laptop, can develop a quantum algorithm, of course, basic one. But how can you work it around in your own home? So basically, hands-on applications I'm going to discuss about and whatever. You will, you will need to know for the future. Because right now, as you can see in the news, AI, blockchain, robotics is the main trend. For the upcoming future, it will be everything related to quantum AI. So let's just get the roll rolling here. All right. This is an index, as you can see here. This is what I want to discuss about. So first of all, of course, if you have any questions, just uh, leave it in the chat. I will answer at the end. First of all, I'm going to work on the definition particular definition on what quantum AI is, how it is formed. Then we'll go into the brief history of it. Why was it created? What is the origin? And what is the use of it? And then moving on into the algorithms, what algorithms are we using? So here we're going to get a bit more mathematical and application-wise, but uh, nothing extremely technical that not everyone can understand. Then what are the essential elements involved in quantum AI? What is required to perform quantum AI and how to develop it? Then what has been achieved so far? which I might tell you has not been much because, well, we're in the year 2020 and quantum AI is pretty uh, recent, so to say. Quantum computing is not so recent, but quantum AI it is. So we'll explore what has been done at the moment. And then what are the challenges, which believe me are many. And then what can we expect in the future as well, okay? So we are going to just run through all these parameters. I will, again, not keep it extremely technical. If you want to keep it technical, then there has to be another workshop altogether. Um, Believe me, it will take a few hours for that. But anyway, let's run through it. If you have any questions, keep it in the chat, and I will answer it at the end. All right, so what is quantum AI? As you can see here, quantum AI is formed out of the regular computing science. So classical computing is based on binary code, one and zeros, as you know, so two elements, and can be either. In quantum computing, however, we have something called qubits, which I will explore a bit, a bit in depth later on. The qubit is a automatic simulation or well, conglomerate of zero and one, both simultaneously. So that is what the power of quantum computer is. Quantum computer can develop directly a conglomeration of both the parameters instead of being independent from each other. That is the difference that is set from your regular laptop to a quantum computer. The regular laptop functions on independent actions, either zero or ones. A quantum computer will function simultaneously on both of them, hence increasing performance and accuracy. And consequently, of course, it will increase uh, the, the performance and the delivery of it. So keeping this in mind, what quantum computer is and what, how it works overall, now we're going to see what quantum AI is uh, in its conglomerate. Right, so quantum AI is the conglomeration or the combination of AI, as you know, it's artificial intelligence, which is the aim to give uh, human-like intelligence or human-like cognitive performance to machines, which you might have come across already because you are all using Siri, Alexa, Cortana, you're using Google, which is of course induced by AI, you're all interacting with chatbots. So do you know what kind of AI applications you are coming across on daily basis? 
So we can assume that quantum GOM, quantum AI is a combination of this AI along with quantum computing. So quantum computing is where we get a bit more complex. Quantum computing is a combination of physics, chemistry, and computer science, of course, and mathematics, which is involving all of them. So quantum computing as a whole is a very complex field. It's a conglomerate of various multidisciplinary areas of knowledge, and it form, is formed out of this. In fact, quantum computing comes from physics, from quanta, which I will explain you the history in a while. In a while. But if the origin is from physics, it moved on into chemistry, analyzing well, molecules, and then it moved on into computer science in combination with mathematics. So if you really want to get into quantum computing or quantum at any point of time, bear in mind that you will need to explore various areas of knowledge. Computer science alone won't do it, and it won't cut it. You need to have knowledge of physics, knowledge of mathematics, knowledge of algebra, and somewhat knowledge in chemistry or whichever area of expertise you wish to specialize upon. Similarly, AI is the combination of this. So just to keep it simple for you, quantum computing is the main area. And along with, we thought that, all right, let's combine it with AI, which are, both of them are two very powerful tools. If we put it together, we can really develop very handsome applications and extremely useful for our daily routine, especially when it comes to pandemic times and, well, disease prediction, as well as disease prevention for the future outcomes which is what AI is trying to do. And if we do it with quantum computing, can be extremely uh, mesmerizing in terms of results. If you look at the screen on the lower side, on the lower right corner, you can see that the definition of quantum. So this is the technical definition of quantum. So quantum, as you can see, is the smallest possible unit within physics, of course, such as energy, matter, or light, for that matter. So how was this discovered? This was discovered by these two, those two individuals, which you know already which are Max Planck and Albert Einstein back in the 1935. So they discovered something called the ultraviolet catastrophe. So if you are from physics background, you should know this already. In fact, you should be familiar, even if you are from physics, you should be familiar with uh, Einstein's discoveries. And when it comes to this particular area, they discovered that the light can be divided into, a into small packages or quanta, which is where the quantum computing, the quantum term comes from. It comes from quanta, which is the smallest unit within the well, The light is not a continuous wave, so it comes from that distribution of light. And what we know as ultraviolet light right now, which is used by law enforcement as well as medical departments in terms of detecting what is on a, on a surface. So that is what we have been, application, that's what the application is for right now. And that is how it translates into quantum computing. So that's, to give you a brief history, as you can see, it comes from physics in combination with maths and then moved on into computer science. Right. Now, what two algorithms can we use here? Well, I can tell you there are more than 35 algorithms that can be used in quantum computing, uh, <laughs> combined with AI for that matter. But there are two main ones which were on daily basis. <laughs> on daily basis. One of them is quantum tempering and the other one is short algorithm. One was created in 1989 and one in 1994. So it's been a while since it's been created. New algorithms have come across, yes, but these new algorithms are not really that, uh, well, performance-wise are not really developed to a point that we can implement them on a daily basis or we can implement them actively in our encryption or well, our performance basis. So when it comes to the quantum tempering one, what we do with this particular algorithm is finding the minimum values in the functions. If you are familiar with uh, algebra or mathematics, you come across functions on daily basis, algorithms and equations. So what the quantum tempering algorithm does is finding minimum values in the functions. Now, what is the use of this? For example, this helps us detecting faulty neural networks. Um, this of course helps increasing the efficiency and performance. So when it comes to all the neural networks, if you look at natural language programming or we look at computer vision for that matter, there are two areas that you might be familiar with so far. So as you know, natural language programming is basically speech detection, um, speech to text detection. And when it comes to computer vision where, well, face recognition, object recognition, 
uh, autonomous vehicles. So all these kind of applications are being the ones but currently implemented in the real world. If we use the quantum computing algorithm here, a quantum tempering algorithm, and we implement it into a neural network, we can detect errors that can escape to our human perception. So the main aim of using these algorithms is to detect something that us, as humans, cannot come across. Then if you look at the short algorithm, this is something you have come across on daily basis for sure. So this is used to decompose numbers into prime factors, okay? Without getting too technical, if you look at the RSA encryption for those who are from computer science background or have any knowledge on or went on computer science and cryptography, RSA is an encryption used for various websites as well as government platforms, um, even their mobile network. And this particular algorithm is what is used to detect the, the prime factors and make it more efficient, the encryption in particular. But if we use quantum computing, in the short algorithm, it will render this particular application such as RSA, or when you use WhatsApp, you come across a message that says uh, your messages are encrypted. So this particular quantum computing algorithm will render all those applications completely useless because quantum computer will encrypt into 15 times more of what the current encryption is. So you won't really be able to break it, even those so-called ethical hackers will have um, difficulties implementing it or coming across it at some point of time. And hence, it will be a quite complex task to develop it and quite a complex task to break the encryption by them. So as you can see, quantum computer can really increase our performance, our security and our well, encryption basis in order to increase performance and develop more accurate systems and more secure systems for the future. These are just two basic algorithms. As I said, there are more than 25 algorithms, but well, let's just touch upon two, which are the main ones, because if I touch upon the 25 ones, I won't really be able to cover within the time that we have. So essential elements that you have to come across quantum AI. So quantum AI, as I told you, is a combination of computer and quantum computing and artificial intelligence. Keeping this in mind, we have three main elements. One is superposition, the other is entanglement, and the other is interference. Now these are elements from quantum computing, but applies the same way for quantum AI. Now, when you come across superposition, as you can see in the image here, there are two states which are happening at the same time. Now, if we take an example, it can be musical notes. If you play an instrument and you play, for example, two instruments simultaneously, and you play two similar musical notes on two different instruments, these particular notes are going to be superposed. So this superposition is what happens when two elements are happening at the same time simultaneously. So when this happens simultaneously, what is happening is that the performance increases in terms of computing power. So this computing power is developed. When you use your laptop or your CPU or well, your mobile phone, you're using uh, basically bits of zeros and ones. So you're going into one action or the other. You cannot go combine, you cannot go superpose. But that happens when you use quantum computer. On the other hand, you have entanglement. Uh, when you talk about entanglement, you're working upon, oh, sorry, you're working upon two different particles separated and being apart, but at the same time being together. What do I mean by this? These are two particles within the, within the algorithm, two elements within the algorithm which are split by distance, but at the same time, they are interconnected by a common wave, a common group, which leads to being together at the same time, though they are keeping a physical distance between them. Of course, we are talking about, uh, well, we're talking about the size of molecules, we're talking about the size of quantum bits, which are not visible at the human eye, at the human range of the eye, but we can understand it in terms of zeros and ones, how they are entangled. Lastly, we have interference. Interference is, as you can see, parallel waves. Interference is basically dependency waves which add or cancel to each other upon performance. Now, how, is, how, is, how are all these elements, superposition, entanglement, and interference being used on daily basis? Well, these are used on, first of all, mobile networks. These are used on weather prediction. These are used on financial stock predictions because we depend upon these elements, depending on how the, the data is combined. So if the data is superposed, we'll apply 
entanglement of superposition. Similarly, if they're entangled, entanglement, and interference, if they're going side by side. In interference, each element depends upon each other. That means that if I go up, the other element will go up as well. And if I go down, you will come down with me. So <clears throat> there's an interdependence happening where an adding or canceling process takes place. But this is a very high performance element, which can increase the performance of the whole, of the whole computer or the whole algorithm in a huge way. All right, uh, I see some questions in the chat. I at least I see one question. And I will answer it now so I don't miss the topic so far. Okay, there is one question here from the Park Mishra, which says, what kind of operating system is needed to run a quantum computer? What are the major components and features of quantum operating system? Well, I'm discussing the features right now. The intents of the operating system, I'll tell you later, I'm going to show you an example, um, what exactly you require. So don't worry about that, I will come across that. And there is another question here below. What are the hot areas, hot research areas in AI that I also discuss later? And how long will it take to train a quantum computer? I will also discuss the data. You don't worry, in terms of practical applications, I will come across it later uh, in a while. I will show you how to work it across in your, in your home, particularly, and how to discuss it, and what are the limitations. Don't worry, keep your seats together, I will, I will come across that. I can see there are more questions coming, but let me just first proceed, then I will, I will answer them on the way. Apart from these three elements that you, you came across earlier, superposition, entanglement, and interference, you have something called qubits. Now, these qubits is basically this. A qubit can be either one, or can be either zero, or can be both. When you talk about your general computer, well, computer program, your laptop, or your CPU, you can either be one or zero, that's it. And when it comes to computer, computing, quantum computing, you can be one, zero, or both simultaneously. So it can be a 50-50, or simultaneously 50-50. So what, what, what does it, how does it help us perform? It helps us perform in a way that our, well, overall activity in the, in the algorithm gets, as you can imagine, improve and increase in terms of performance because the, the performance is way faster as well as more, way more accurate. So this is what it leads to. This, and these qubits are essential. That is what forms quantum computing. Without qubits, we cannot develop quantum computing. Now, the more qubits, the more accuracy and the highest performance. So as you can imagine, even if you have a laptop, the more memory RAM and the more GBs or terabytes that your laptop might allow, uh, in terms of quantum computing, the more qubits you have, the more performance you can develop. And the more qubits you have, your accuracy also increases way more, way much, like way faster and in a, in a very the hugely developed way. So just to put it in simple terms, this is a, I hope you can all see the screen in full because you will need it. If you wish to take a screenshot of this, feel free. If you wish to, uh, well, let me just give you the whole definitions here. If you wish to, for me to send you this, this code, I can also do it, no issues. As you can see, this is on Python. So those who are not familiar with programming language, which I hope all of you are somehow, this is Python programming language. Uh, you can use this on C++ as well, or Java if you like, or Julia for that matter. In fact, uh, my, to my students in, at Waxing, I teach them on Python and Julia, but so if you look at Python particularly, which is pretty easy going and the interface is quite friendly, user friendly. You look at this particular algorithm, which is basically 23 lines of code. You can run a quantum algorithm on your laptop. Now for, for this particular algorithm, you are going to only use 26 qubits, which is pretty small and not really, uh, so develop, accuracy is going to be compromised as well as the performance. So it's not going to really be a very powerful quantum computing algorithm, but still will do to perform certain, certain tasks. What do you need to perform this particular code? First of all, you need something called PyQuil or PyQuil, depending on how you want to pronounce it. This is, as you can see, the definition I have placed here is a Python library used for uh, well, quantum programming, quantum programming in, in general, and quantum computing. This is using Quill. Quill is a quantum instruction language, which is developed by a company called Brigetti Computing, which you can Google it. 
Rigetti Computing is a very famous company which develops quantum computing chips and quantum computing uh, motherboards. So when you develop this particular algorithm in your, in your laptop, in your Anaconda Navigator or your well, Python interface or terminal, when you come across this, you can use PyQuil, which will increase the performance and run the algorithm faster. Secondly, you can use KVM, which KVM, as you can see, is well, a quantum virtual machine. Uh, of course, you, have, you cannot run this on your computer uh, per se, on your, on your RAM. You have to run this on the cloud. Just that you use, if you know, uh, Google Colab. If you have ever used Google Colab, which is basically programming in the cloud, so using the same parameters as Google Colab, you use KVM. So KVM is quantum, quantum virtual machine. You are using the algorithm and running it on the cloud. What do you get by running this in the cloud? Well, you get a powerful interface for one. Secondly, you get your laptop or your CPU not to crash because this quantum algorithm is gonna be um, slightly more powerful than what your computer can afford by itself. So that's one. And secondly, you will be able to as well perform on uh, the algorithm on a very accurate basis and develop your performance as well as the task that you wish to achieve. One minute. So as you can see, there are going to be 26 qubits. As I said, 26 qubits is not much, not to say it's almost nothing, but still to give it a try and learn how it works is quite useful. Now, what are we going to do with this particular algorithm? We're going to do something very basic, something not very complicated. And if you look at it, something not very useful also, but it helps you see how quantum computing works. As you can see in the last line where it says print, the command print, you have your quantum dice draw all the time and then you set the dice value and you're going to print this. What are you going to do with this? You're going to predict, predict a multi-outcome result. You're going to look for a multi-outcome result. Uh, why do you use this here? Why are you running, like rolling a dice? As you know, in any sort of game or poker, when you roll a dice, the dice has multiple results. Those multiple results normally go from one to eight, means one to eight, uh, the numbers, or one to six, depending on the dice you're using. So what are we going to do with this quantum computing? When we're going to apply it in a way that is going to predict the most uh, adequate results and the multi-outcome results in terms of a dice. Uh, we know that there are eight phases in a dice and there are six phases in a dice depending on what we use, but a quantum algorithm doesn't know. A quantum algorithm is not a human being, does not have knowledge of poker or any sort of other game. Hence, a dice might come, might come across with multiple outcomes. So what, this particular algorithm is gonna do, is gonna predict the number of outcomes that are possible, how many times those outcomes will come across, and how accurate these outcomes will be, and how useful these outcomes will be as well. So, as you can imagine, this application of quantum computing here is not very useful in terms of practical terms, but if we apply this particular algorithm, of course, this is a trial, this is for you to try at home, not for anything else. But if you apply this particular usage to, let's say, uh, weather conditions or disease production, pandemic production, we, we can actually come across uh, well, a number of pandemic predictions such as coronavirus or Ebola or malaria and how many number of cases will come across and in what particular regions in the world. So as you can see, quantum computing can help us develop predictions way faster than what AI can do. And why we're combining it with quantum, like with artificial intelligence is because we are taking the best of AI, which is the predictive tool based on data, because uh, AI is nothing but data. Combined with the power of quantum computing, that high performance, that high uh, enable performance and high enable accuracy will give us the outcome desire and the number of predictions we wish to have. So as you can see, this both combined, like this both elements combined, AI plus quantum computer or QC, it can really be the future of the world. In fact, it is said to be the future of humanity and how we will perform from here on. So my advice for you, since this is gonna be the future and there is no other foreseeable future anymore apart from quantum AI and robotics, my advice is get into this field quickly, like as quick as you can, get, get through it and learn through it, memorize it, understand it, enjoy it, because you will need this for the future of jobs, for the future of performance and the future of humanity by itself. 
So bear this in mind, this is very important. And I'm going to read the questions which are in the chat now, but before that, I forgot to mention something. Those who are not familiar with AI, as you, as I can see, there are many people on the chat who are not really that familiar with AI. AI, you might have come across the past past war of AI. Like AI is used by everybody. AI is like everything anymore. AI is like a god right now for everyone. Uh, you can see startups, you can see government officials. Not not just talking about India, but talking about anywhere else. Uh, you, you see government. You see uh, you see startups. You see companies. You see everybody on social media, especially now during this pandemic. As you can see, there are n numbers of webinars, and all the webinars. It seems like now we are getting all the experts around the world, and there are more experts, per, more experts per square meter than it was before. So everyone is talking about AI when they don't, don't really know what AI is. AI is the combination of probability, mathematics, algebra, physics, and computer science. All right, probability, physics, and by probability, I mean statistics as well. Physics, maths, computer science, and algebra all together. That is, why, that is what AI is. AI is nothing else. AI functions only and uniquely because we have previous data. Without previous data, AI cannot perform. And without previous data, AI doesn't exist. So bear this in mind that AI is not a demigod, AI is not here to take over the world. AI is not here to kill us all and to perform some sort of Terminator-like reality with Arnold Schwarzenegger. It is not that. AI is here to help us increase our performance in our daily tasks. That's it. But nothing else than that. And those who you see online, because I see it on daily basis, that they talk about AI is the only future, AI is this, AI is that, when they themselves don't know what AI is, AI is purely maths and stats, as I told you right now, and in combination with computer science, which is programming basically. So AI is not impossible to learn. Yes, it does take some efforts because you have to learn various fields, but it's not impossible. So it is, it is very much, it's, it's much, like it's very much possible to use it. It's not gonna be a very easy journey to learn it, but it's not impossible at all. Similarly, with quantum computing, you have to learn it step by step. So first you go from computer science basics, understand physics, how physics work, and then go into mathematics a little. Algebra, of course, is important for algorithms. And then jump into quantum computing, combine both AI and quantum computing, and progressively, as the year pass, you will be able to see how the performance works. For example, I can tell you, before I answer the questions in the chat, I can tell you, as part of my PhD thesis, I developed an HR algorithm, which resembles the Chinese social credit score system. The Chinese social credit score system, if you don't know what it is, it is basically the tracking, the social tracking of all Chinese citizens. Uh, I'm giving them points in base of how good of a citizen they are. So this tracks their faces, their voice recognition, what they say, how they say it, why they say it, how do they feel way saying it, how do they perform, how they walk, everything has been tracked. So I develop an algorithm, well, oriented or based on that case study, apply for HR, apply for companies. So I tested it in Europe on a trial basis in a company and a law enforcement agency as well, because I had the access for that. So I tried it. And basically what the algorithm does is if you install it in the CCTV cameras and you install it on microphones, the algorithm detects, uh, well, detects various things. Among them is the, the faces, tracks the faces, recognizes faces, tracks what emotions they're feeling, what they are saying, what emotions are they feeling while saying it? How are they saying things? What word they are saying will impact the company in the long run? How are they working? Uh, which employees are likely to leave the company? Which employees are likely to stay for the longer time? Which employees deserve to get a remuneration? And which employees deserve to get fired? So all this is strapped down into one well, a very long algorithm, more than uh, 12,000 lines of code, like I, I, I repeat, 12,000 lines of code on Python, which is not a joke, it's a, lot of, it's a very long algorithm, very distributed in various parts. So all this has been dragged down and it's been improved by quantum computing. So if I, I run this on AI, AI will take days to run all this data because it's not that advanced, especially on Python, but combining it with quantum computing can help increasing performance in a huge way. In fact, it can save me 
from weeks to days in getting results, right? So this is the power of the power of implementing it on a daily basis. Now let me just see what questions in the chat, which I can see there are many. Um, all right, where was I last? All right. First of all, if we are talking about how AI works, applications, all that, I will discuss it later. In terms of operating system, I already told I already told you I'm using Python right now. You can use Julia. You can use C++. Operating system, you can use it on, of course, on iOS. You can use it on Windows as well. Ideally, you should, you should use it on, on Linux. Linux works pretty well for this, but if you use iOS, like I'm using right now a MacBook, so I'm using an iOS device, it's fine. And you can use it as a Windows device, it's also fine. Any operating system will do. It's not restricted to any operating system, so to say. But, well, a very powerful quantum computer won't be able to, to run on very accurate basis if you run it on a Windows device, as you can imagine. Now, um, what else is there? What are current research challenges in AI? How AI is ready to for IoT? Uh, well, research challenges in AI right now are basically ethics, that is one. Uh, ethics in AI is very challenging because we are working from an ethical perspective of human beings. In fact, the algorithm I told you about, the HR algorithm, uh, has some ethical issues, privacy issues, because my algorithm used to discriminate between women and men for some reason. And even if, when you go into recruiting, it used to discriminate on people who were maybe Chinese looking or Asian looking, uh, dark skin color, white skin color. So the algorithm has this kind of parameters adhered to it. So removing that from the, from the algorithm is pretty challenging. So that's a very hot area of research. Another hot area of research, as you can see right now, is healthcare and coronavirus and COVID-19. Because, well, as you can see now, in the last two, three months, it, something is very clear to me right now, that uh, in life we might have success, we may have money, and we may have anything we want. But if we don't have health and we are not healthy, we have nothing. So AI applied to healthcare is a very critical area and something which I believe is very important and needs to be widely explored because unless it is explored in a very huge way, we won't be able to predict further pandemics in the future. In fact, in November 2019, uh, the COVID-19 that we are all experiencing was actually predicted by an AI algorithm in China. But, well, Chinese authorities chose to ignore that and chose to go on their own. And then in January and February 2020, we all know what happened, uh, how history took place. So AI can really help in this way, but it's a bit challenging. So my advice for those who want to research upon AI will be first of all, focus on ethics, like as a topic, AI and ethics. Secondly, will be AI in healthcare. And lastly will be AI, um, probably a smart cities. So the future of the world is a smart cities. And of course, I'm talking about research, not, not only from an academic viewpoint, I'm talking about research from a job viewpoint. So if you want to get jobs into the field of AI, you have to go for where the world is demanding it. So right now the world is moving towards computer vision, means Tesla or any sort of autonomous vehicles. Healthcare, as you know, right now we need it more than ever. And ethics, these three areas are very hot. Any other area will be important, but will won't be as relevant at the moment. So focus upon these areas if you want to research upon that. I see there's another question here. Yeah, okay. there, were, there were more questions, Dr. Raul, on a possible research area in a quantum AI. Also, there was one question, can we use a MATLAB for implementing AI? Yes, you can use MATLAB for AI. In fact, I uh, recently, recently, and last and, two and weeks, I wrote a research paper on that, yes. Uh, there was one question, what are the specific use cases which we can expect in the financial industry and how it can be integrated with the blockchain technology? or with the AI? Okay, so see, these questions come because people are confused. These questions come because people are listening, AI, blockchain, quantum computing, they're coming all together, and okay, let's throw it. Yes. Yeah. The problem is that, okay, we have to be very clear here. AI is one thing, quantum computing is another. They have been combined, that's fine. But blockchain is something different. Like, we are talking about- a different AI. area, yes. Blockchain runs on Python as well, runs on C++, runs on very various programming languages, that's fine. But 
you can run it on AI. That is also possible. In fact, I, I always teach my students how to create their own cryptocurrency, how to create their own blockchain on Python, which is fine. But blockchain is different. Blockchain is not, does not only have to do with finance. Finance is cryptocurrency. Blockchain applies to supply chain, applies to healthcare, applies to data encryption, applies to many fields, education field as well. So it is possible to combine it. It's, it everything is possible in life, but the problem is that we cannot, we cannot try to do everything in computer science. Like we cannot take AI, quantum computer, blockchain, and think because they're all very famous terms and very famous words, put it together. Because there is also one question which is combining two very different area. Mm -hmm. uh, how cloud computing helps to overcome challenges of AI? So cloud and AI or quantum AI. Uh, yeah. yeah, so basically that's what I was showing. As you can see in the screen right now, that is a cloud algorithm. Like I'm using a quantum virtual machine. A virtual machine is basically cloud, uh, like Google Colab. If you use Google Colab, you're using the cloud to run your codes, simply because your laptop might not sustain it. So if you have a laptop which is not that good, let's keep it simple, you use the same code in the cloud. So it runs with Microsoft Azure or with Amazon Web Services with similar platforms on the cloud. So that is how the cloud enables us to run codes when we don't have the hardware to run it in our particular device. That is how it helps. And it helps us, of course, store the information up in the so-called cloud and keep it stored and I can access it from different well, devices, my laptop, your laptop, my mobile phone, doesn't matter. I can access that particular code anytime. So that's how it helps in practical terms. It helps in many other ways, but this is the practical aspect of it. Uh, Dr. Girish Tere, can you make Anand Upadhyay as a co-host? He is also having some research area. He can ask some question. Uh, also, there was one question. Uh, is there any special hardware is which is used in a quantum uh, AI? Special hardware, yes, there's a special hardware. Well, if you run, normally when we talk about quantum AI, to run a powerful quantum computer, you need at least 1,000, 1000 to 1,000 qubits at the very least. So to run those qubits, you need to buy a quantum computer, which are, are being sold right now, but I hope your pocket is quite deep because they're quite expensive. They are not cheap at all. Um, I will discuss later the prices and how it works and so on. But so far, only companies like Google, IBM, Mercedes-Benz, Apple are working around this area because it takes money and resources. Uh, there is also one question. NLP codes can be used can be used in a Python ID or we need some other uh, tools to be used. No, you can use NLP in, in Python. You can use it for a speech to text, speech translation, text to speech. Uh, speech emotion recognition, you can use various tools on Python when it comes to natural language programming. That's not a problem. Uh, Mr. Anand Upadhyay, you have any question? Sir, how we can use this quantum AI for uh, what facial recognition? For facial recognition? Yes. Because well, my... uh, well, so far, even, I mean, I'm, I'm right now in Hyderabad, and I can tell you that uh, the Langana State Police is using it for predicting who is wearing a mask and who is not wearing a mask, uh, just to predict well social distancing as well as who is compliant to the rules imposed by the government. If we look at other practical aspects when it comes to corporates, as I said, if you apply it to human resources, you can see who, what employees are entering the premises, what employees are leaving the premises without any sort of biometrics or signature. You can see what employees are feeling. Are they happy? Are they upset? Are they angry? Are they, what are the feeling essentially? Everything in detail. Um, well, of course you can use it for security measures as well in terms of your mobile phone, unlocking your mobile phone. Uh, you can use it for photographs itself. You can use it for crime prediction. You can predict what crime rates might be available in terms of what actions people are well, conducting and what, who, who have been in the criminal database in the past and what sort of criminals who have been bailed out or have been discharged are walking around the streets. So all this is being used. If you look at the current wall right now, it's been used for social distancing to keep uh, the distance between two individuals. So that is also, well, a practical application at the moment. I don't know how we'll evolve in the future. Facial recognition has n number of applications, n number of, even to, I don't know if any of you has been in, in Germany, uh, but I've, I've lived in Berlin for, for a couple of months 
um, in Germany, particularly companies like BMW and Mercedes are implementing facial recognition in their vehicles in order for you to open your car. So the car will only open the moment you come in front of the door, there's a camera, it recognizes your face and it opens up. Other than that, the car will never open. So that's an application of it, hands-on application of it. Useful at some way or some, well, depends how you want to see it, but that is one of them. Yes, sir. Sir, is any uh, specific hardware requirement for quantum AI or quantum computing? Is there any specific requirement of hardware? Like what must be the configuration of your system so that you can uh, implement the quantum AI? Because you know, a country like India, the people, they are facing lots of problems related with the hardware specifications. Right. So can you recommend what should be the minimum configuration so that we can, as a student, if we recommend anyone to start the work, then how they can start? What should be the configuration? Uh, right now, as I'm doing this presentation, I'm showing you this code. This particular code runs on my particular my MacBook, uh, which is a regular iOS device. If you have a Windows computer as well, you can run it. I have run this on Dell computers, which are Windows 10 computers. You can run it on Linux as well. But the problem will be the number of qubits. The more number of qubits, the more computing power you will need. As an individual, unless you have nearly not less than $10 billion to buy a quantum computer, I'm sorry, you will have a tough time developing a quantum computer in a like, very powerful one, I'm saying. So unless you actually work for Google or IBM, because IBM has a very powerful quantum computer, it will be tough. On an individual basis, to try it and to learn how to work, how it works, you can do it on Python itself, like I'm doing here in front of you. That is not a problem. But it will be only with 26 to 35 qubits, not something really advanced. But to start with, will do. It's not a big challenge. So for students to learn, this is the way, using the regular open source programming languages that you can easily download. Okay, sir, thank you. Uh, with this, uh, we can, uh, uh, is there any other question? <clears throat> now, uh, with this, we end of the session. Uh, over to you, Dr. Vinit Vedya. Thank you so much, Santosh. Uh, it was indeed a great pleasure and pride to witness this particular session where Dr. Rawl has talked about all the fundamentals which are required consideration for the artificial intelligence. And I think uh, the future is going to be ruled over by artificial intelligence because the human power needs some kind of a support IT sector. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Rawl, for your contribution towards this conclave and such an informative lecture. And definitely our thanks are due to our principal as well as Dr. Santosh. But to propose the formal vote of thanks, may I kind of request Dr. S.D. Asgekar, the vice principal and convener of this conclave to please come up. Dr. S.D. Asgekar, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Vinit. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Raul Rodericks for an enlightening and uh, enriching presentation on the topic, quantum artificial intelligence. We appreciate having the clear focus on the topic in spite the quantum artificial intelligence is the eight in the conceptual research domain. Thank you very much, sir. As you all know, the organization of such events are generally the result of close cooperation among several institutions and individuals. It is my great pleasure to express on behalf of the organizers a deep appreciation for the support and encouragement provided by the management and the principal, Dr. Mrs. Chaitali Chakravarti of the Thakur College. I feel privileged to Dr. S.K. Singh, our IQC coordinator and also conclave convener for acting as a catalyst and organizing such a productive international conclave. Our sin sincere thanks to all the participants who are the actually reasons for the successful conclave. Thank you everyone, especially Dr. Uh, Dr. Raul Rodericks, Professor of Artificial Intelligence, Machine Learning and Robotics from Vaccin School of Business for associating with Thakur College of Science and Commerce for this uh, particular session. Thanks especially to Mr. Alad Kawadikar from Netherlands for joining the platform today morning. Thakur College of Science and Commerce feel proud for having own alumnus with us today. Thank you, Mr. Alad. Uh, thank you very much everyone once again and wishing fruitful outcome from remaining sessions scheduled on the third day of this international conclave. Thank you very much.
let me add, let 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 me add one small point here yesterday night just i ping uh, dr alhad like are you available and immediately he says at 11:30 pm and today morning he was available so we are very proud of you correct, he correct. is our prestigious alumni and yes, he is sir. always there thank you dr dol for joining us